Is there anything you want to, special you want to tell us about your art or your paintings or? I didn't know it was art. It's just something I'd like to do. It got the name art from somebody else. All my, all my life, ever since I can remember, since I've been big enough. Well, before I started, before I learned how to write. And Mama would hold my hand and show me how to draw things that she knew how to draw. One day I wanted some paint, and so she brought me some of those painting, you know, crayons. And they smell so good to me, I thought that was the best smelling thing. <laughs> so that's that I wanted to paint. artistic bent was encouraged from childhood and she followed her mother's wisdom to paint what you know. She was nurtured. It wasn't the norm because children had to work on the farm. They didn't have time. And yet she was able to, after her chores were completed, to draw and carve. And Helen's parents encouraged this. My name is Kathy Moses, author of Outsider Art of the South and Helen LaFrance Folk Art Memories. The first time I met Helen LaFrance was in 1994, and my immediate impression was that she was modest but independent. Believed in God and was very serene and at peace with herself. And there was something, a, a very deep strength in her that was as deep as her artistry. And I realized that this was a woman who was empowered. She was her own woman. I mean, she, she had her own money. She could, uh, as we might say, she could do as she pleased. Yeah, she did her own art. As, as we go back further and further with her, the more things we find, we just see, you know, how she developed over the years. Helen was disciplined in everything that she did, except for her art. That was Helen's. That was her creative outlet. She did it for herself. And at a time when Southern women were supposed to accept the way it was and be respectful, some even obsequious, Helen was a property owner. She owned land. She owned farmland and houses in town that she rented out, and she did it quietly, discreetly, on the down low. But she was a landowner, which gave her a security and an impressive status to those who knew her. Well, I was brand new in the business. I was out at the Nashville flea market 
And somebody just came up to me and said, you ought to find this lady, Helen France. She was just in a group show at the Owens Borough Museum of Art. And uh, I just thought, hey, why not? So I tracked her down and went to her house, and that's how it all started, November of 1991. When I came back home, and you know, when you get older, you start getting interested in your genealogy. So I wanted to look up my history, and I said, well, by that time, everybody I knew had passed on. So I went looking for Miss Helen, and that's how we reconnected. I happened to run into her daughter in the store, and I asked her, where does Miss Helen live now? She said, well, I'm going to go over now. And I followed over and went in the house, started talking, and I said, Miss Helen, you know who I am? No, but you sound like Ollie B. She <laughs> always remember my mother. So, and then after that, you know, I would just go over there several times a week. We'd sit and talk. She'd tell me things I'd never heard before, so I'd go. And she, but she, I, and it was always amazing. And everybody was always so taken back with her because of her knowledge. That's what they would be taken back with the most about her because of everything that she knew and she could tell you about, you know. I, I met Helen, I, I, I knew of her you know, just word of mouth. You know, she was kind of starting to get a, a little bit of a reputation. People were talking about her. I was sitting in my store and she moves across the street and puts a little uh, art gallery in right over here on the corner. And she's putting her paintings in the, in the window. And uh, I go by there one day and there's one of the most incredible paintings I've ever seen in my life. And I said, how much is that one? I said, I want to buy that. She goes, well, that's already sold, you know. And so I, I'm getting to know her pretty good. And my, I have a little boy and uh, he goes over there. He loves her. And uh, she, get, she gave him uh, art lessons. And uh, matter of fact, my little boy, when he got to about the fifth grade, he was in there and they were painting. And the teacher came in there and told him that uh, he was holding his paintbrush wrong. He said, well, that's how Helen the Franks told me to do it and she sent him to the office. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, Helen was just, she, she was really good to him, good to me. What I really respect about her is her independence. So, so independent and she didn't take handouts, she worked hard. She worked in food service for a high school and then got to the point where she could paint full time and took care of herself, didn't ask for handouts, and then took care of all her family members. That, to me, whether she painted a single painting or not, that, to me, speaks volumes. You know, nothing that you do for my grandmother now could never repay. I mean, she was a giving person. I was having little problems, you know, getting around, so she's like, I'm gonna just give you a car, my old car, and that way you can break ties with your dad, whatnot, and no strings attached. You know, that's what I like about her. I remember one time she gave these people, I don't know if they just, she just want to help them, but I remember her giving them her Cadillac. I remember her giving it to them, going to the courthouse, putting it in their name. The last time I saw Helen LaFrance was in 2010 when I went to visit her to interview her for the book that I was writing on her. Her circumstances had changed. She was in a nursing home, not living independently on her land, like the last times I'd seen her. but she had taken over a corner of the day room in the nursing home and made a studio for herself. And when we walked in, she was painting on a door that somebody had brought her instead of a stretched canvas. And she said to me then, the same thing she said to me 
almost 20 years before. When I'm not eating or sleeping, I'm painting. And she was. I never was much on talking. I do better thinking. <laughs> Do you remember the first painting you ever did? Yeah, a fox going up a hill and a fox don't go up hill. <laughs> they go across the, down the foot of the hill through the woods, you know, that part of it. Now, a fox don't like to be seen that well. well. Can you tell me how your mother influenced your painting? She likes to draw, but she didn't paint. My mom used to hold my hand and help me to draw things. and. Uh, she liked to draw, too. Why did you enjoy painting so much? <clears throat> Why did it make you happy? Oh, because I liked the way things and trees and things looked. And, and I asked my mom, why don't you can't pan, can some of this stuff? She said, you can't can the outdoors. I, so I got to think about well, maybe I could paint some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she used to can peaches. And her mama did, too, because her mom didn't can as much as she did because she wasn't that old. But she can things too. I do what I do from memory. That's what I pay for. I just get to think about something and I said, well, I remember how that was. I believe I put it on paper or canvas or whatever. I guess it's just a way of reliving it all again. Tell me about this. Is this your home? No, that's my grandmother's house. Grandmother and grandfather, King Ligon. Thank you for letting me see it again. Now, are you in the picture? Oh, yeah, but I couldn't tell me if anybody else. <laughs> I think that was me down there next to my grandmother. Didn't, he, didn't you tell me one time he bought some land from Robert Hobbs? His first property bought from your daddy bought from Robert Hobbs? You got it all mixed up. See, my daddy bought the ground that he brought from the Bar Hill down in the, what we call down in the bottom, between Hickory and Mayfield. Her father and grandfather owned their own land and worked it at a time when sharecropping was the norm. Woman, and Helen's family was outside the norm. They grew their own crops, and they didn't rent from other people. They owned their own land. How did Helen's grandfather acquire that land? I don't know, and we probably won't know from Helen. She's very quiet about it. She's proud. She's very proud, and she has a right to be. Helen grew up under Jim Crow laws, customs, that racially segregated the South from 1874 to 1965. But I never did get to go to high school. I didn't just go to grade school much. My father always said he wasn't able to send us all to school, and if he wasn't going to send one, he wasn't going to send everybody. So that left me out, too. The way they talked about school, I was afraid to go to school, afraid to think about it, because I just thought you'd go to school well. The teacher would get a big stick and just beat the daylights out of you. Well, but then it wasn't like that, I found out. Her parents went into town and bought books and taught her so that she was educated. And then she had educated herself. She was, just, she was smart. And what was so bad about it, you had to know it was self-taught because she didn't get to go to school that much. And she taught herself a lot of how to read and write. She knew a lot of medical stuff. She just knows things. They also instilled a great work ethic in her. Now, does 
painting over here, behind this one over here, Miss Helen. What's that? What's that painting of? Is that your church? Yeah. Shelf and Shaffle. That's where I went to school when I was a kid. Yeah, that is Shelton Town, but all these people in that river, that's, I added that. Glory, glory, hallelujah. She was known for her memory paintings. The vanishing landscape around there, uh, the old schoolhouses, the old churches, the old barns. The church that she grew up in, the din what they call dinner on the grounds, in which, you know, uh, we call them church picnics. She started painting those church scenes and the, uh, you know, the ones with a lot of people. That's what, you know, that's what people really, really wanted. And that's pretty much what she's noted for. Just keep on the dollar. We moved in, in in 1997, and I hired an art consultant to find original art from our, at that time, three states. We were in Kentucky, Illinois, and Indiana. When we got toward the end of the collection of 125 original pieces, uh, the consultant looked at me one day and he said, we're kind of missing diversity. And I said, fine, where do we go? And he said, to Helen the France or. And I recommend that we just commission her to do memory art from her childhood, from her memory. And that's where this piece came from. And uh, obviously it's become a, a centerpiece of our collection and, and many folks have been attracted to it. It's, it's just a precious piece. distinctly a moment of saying, why folk art? Mm -hmm. But part of it was, we've collected things that make us smile. Yeah, you can't look at a piece of folk art and not And that's hopefully what all this still does. Because ultimately, folk art in many ways is defined by the, the viewer. I have shown those church picnics, I can't tell you how many shows, and people come by and they go, that's my, I know that church, that's right outside of the town where I live, whether it be Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, any of these states down here, we've got all those, that church is everywhere. The neurological mechanics in the brain do something when the eyes come into contact with the art. And what you see may be different when it goes through your brain than what I see. The result is an emotional response to the art. And she has that ability to bring that out in people. We were in New York at the Black Fine Arts Fair that time when Oprah bought some of her paintings and she bought one of the church picnics. Well, it was not long after that that I saw this documentary on TV about Oprah. And it showed the little church down in Mississippi that uh, Oprah grew up in. And it was exactly like that church picnic. about when I first met you when you were painting in that old school bus out there. And I didn't like it. It was the hottest place I was ever in. And the windows didn't raise up because it was an old bus. I knew I like to smudge the death in there one day. I had noticed it being so hot. It just closed down on your head. I'm glad to be out of it, I know that much. She was living outside of Mayfield a little bit, which in this part of the world you call it, say she lived out in the country. 
and I, I went to where her little house was and you know the first thing I saw was that school bus up on the hill. I know the bus was very hot. I mean, at times, like I said, she had the sterning wheel taken out. I don't even know if she had any seats. It's just, just the empty bus. The school bus was her studio. That's where she painted. It was full of paintings. I honestly don't know how long she had been painting in that school bus. You see all the little windows in there? The sun just come right straight through. And then uh, it was metal, you know. And it's just like being in a oven, I guess, with the oven turned on. But I didn't notice it so much. I raised the windows, and when I raised the windows, the squirrels and the birds would come in. Well, I'll tell you what happened with the bus. A real good friend of mine named Mickey Collins he, he knew I was going up there one day, and he said, hey, can I ride with you? He just wanted something to do. Mickey didn't have any interest in art whatsoever. He was a, a big contractor. He, a dime turned to a dollar with this guy. So we get up there, and you know, he sees this old bus she's painting in, and this, that, and the other, and he said to Helen, if you will Draw me a picture of what you want your studio to look like and mail it to me. I will send somebody up here to build a studio for you. And she says, I can't afford to have it done. And he said, just keep painting. That's the way you pay me. But she really got, you know, she was just able to have at it in that studio, you know. Don't you remember when those guys came up and framed up that building? Did they tear it down? No, no it's still there. there. You remember they came and built it and you worked out of it for a long time. I, I remember. I made some big pictures in there. Well, it used to be when they first built this building, oh, uh, I was trying to work, you know, at night, and I couldn't work out here at night because I could just imagine all kinds of faces looking through the windows. <laughs> and there would be some big old long-faced ugly horses and snakes and everything. <laughs> I just couldn't work at night. Well, she would paint at nighttime in the studio, but she was, she was afraid out there. She thought she saw things out there. And I said, well, Helen, why don't you paint me what you think is out there? And she painted me this just wonderful painting. It's one of my top, if I had to pick top five paintings that she's ever done for my personal liking, it's one of them. Because it's just, it, it's, it's raw. Helen was a student of the Bible. And I can always remember her how she had this big, thick black Bible there. And, but, and, Several times over the years, uh, when we interviewed her for the book, uh, Kathy asked her, she would never elaborate on these visions. I think they were so very personal to her that, you know, and Helen was the kind of person, when she says no, it's no. She did a series of vision paintings, and there weren't that many in number, maybe about 18. And I believe that she was in a different place when she was painting them. She didn't really like to talk about them, but they were usually verses of the Bible. She was a great interpreter of the Bible. They were intense, they were scary, and they didn't look like anything else. And after she did them, she never mentioned them again. If you asked her about them, she didn't want to talk about them. They were private visitations. There was a painting called Ezekiel's Vision, and I was really taken aback by that painting. Why did she do that? I, you know, she did it. So, uh, that was just a, 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 a totally, another dimension of Helen. The 
And I knew much about Jacob's ladder then as I do now. <laughs> and he went to sleep and he dreamed he saw angels coming up and down. But what did I know about this? <laughs> We were invited to come down to this church in Mayfield to see the mural that she did in the 1940s. And I had not seen a work from her that early. And it was just, I was just taken aback from it. I mean, when you walk in the doors of the sanctuary and you look at this just beautiful painting on the wall, the further the way you were from it, the more detailed it was. It was signed Helen Robin, which we're not sure was either her first or her second husband. She was a Lynn first, then she was a Robin, and then I think she was a, what was that man's name? Uh, McCamel, she was McCamel. And then she married some man from Fulton, and I didn't know who that was. And then she married some man when she used to live across from the church. And then she was married to my uncle. Helen was married five times. And I think that, you know, she was, she was an independent woman. Well, I, I think my grandmother, she couldn't, I mean, it was something, yeah, I mean, being married, I guess it was okay, but as independent my grandmother was, I don't think she needed a man. I think she took care of them, them not taking care of her. I guess if things didn't suit her fancy, she was gone. She never had any children by these men. You know, she used to sign them Helen of France or, then she signed them Helen of France. I've seen early paintings of her signed Helen. Helen is really a modern woman. She started buying actual art supplies at the grocery store when she was in her 40s. In 1986, she started painting full time. This is a woman who grew up toiling on her family's farm. Her family owned the farm and it gave her tremendous security, whether she knew it or not. I remember her telling me about a painting and, and seeing the painting where a family was all loaded up in a cart with a mule pulling it and Helen was a child and she said to her mother, can I go play with those children? And her mother said, no, they're moving. Helen didn't know there was a depression going on, but that's what was happening. They stayed, other people had to go. This used to be a busy place for train, you know, and you couldn't go down the valley or cross that track without you and having to wait for a train, and then you could hear the train whistle, and they had one called Whiskey Dick. Going to the Duke, I read. I didn't know then what to tell me, because that's what they used it for, to bring whiskey back from the Duke on. It wasn't anywhere for real, but when uh, Mr. Glisson was living, that's a long time ago, when we were kids, he had a grocery down there, and. He had everything in his store. He sold shoes and boots and cow feed and hog feed and plows and just anything. It was a general merchandise store. And I guess I still remember some of that. He was in Viola too. Tin roof. It's a barn. Had dances. Yeah. Did you ever go? No. no. Mom didn't let us. <laughs> she knew it. <laughs> <laughs> she knew it. <laughs> she knew. It. Of course, I was right in the middle of it. Mom didn't know it because the rest of them didn't tell it. <laughs> Yeah, and when, when I was getting mad at mom before I'd done so-and-so, when? 
Y se echa, oh, este es mi país, le lo. I knew that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> oh, me, I used to keep my shoes wore out all the time dancing. I shall sing a story. When my mother passed away, it, it just kind of really made me think, you know, where could my mother have been? I mean, where, you know, what, what really could have really happened? I mean, she raised my mother, but we didn't really know. I mean, this is a special woman. You know, we didn't, didn't know enough see this coming at all. Granny didn't paint for money, she did. She painted because that's something she loved to do. And it was in her heart, you know. And she shared whatever she had with anybody that really needed it. That's what I do know. It was a thrill to be able to visit Helen in the context of her art. She's like the double whammy. She's the black woman artist. You know, I mean, you just, you know, you can add or take away from her, but she is contemporary. She's truly contemporary. She's painting in the moment of her moment, of a time gone by, recollections of her life, and we get to see it all. And I have to say that getting to know her over the years has been wonderful, and it has enriched my life. What I believe about Helen and her place in American art history is that we, we're seeing her in a different light now. We are able to recontextualize her. And I see her not as some country woman or some woman who is, is not sophisticated. I find her a very intelligent and very sophisticated lady a modern woman before that term was ever coined. And a woman who was extremely loving and giving, adopted many children along the way, raised children. She was a landowner. She'd have rental houses. She would give them away. She would give cars away. She, she I guess it goes back to the thing, the more you give away, the more you get. And she just, that was Helen. Helen is my mission. I want to see her take her rightful place in American art history. I'm just a person who loved her work, who fell in love not only with her work, but her and, and her kindness, her way of life. And it has made me a better person. Hmm. Well, the first step I do if you want to tell me how to paint, what I need to do to be able to do something like you did? What should I do first? Maybe throw it away? No, I'm talking for real. How would I learn how to do what you did? You don't learn to do anything. But you I just do what you say. That's all I know. I don't want to ever stop. But, uh... You never know what might happen to you, and so I'm always halfway prepared for that day.